Hi, I'm Janice Sweatlow, and today as I discuss some aspects of Canada's mythos and practical uh, government and governance, practical politics, I'm referring to and will be quoting from a book by George Woodcock, The Century That Made Us, Canada 1814 to 1914. So this goes back to, uh, you know, the late 1700s, early 1800s when a lot of settlers were um, coming into America. And it said, uh, uh, you know, at this time, there, we're looking at, uh, in particular, 1812. And uh, it's saying the Indians in this part of the British domain were already a dwindling and powerless minority. So you see this attitude about domestic ethnic minority is not something new. Um, but the effort to uh, cement it, if you will, has certainly um, come into focus and is a concluding strategy um, initiated through um, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau with his 1982 Constitution Act. In, in specific, Section 35. And I've done a lot of uh, discussion and writing about how Section 35 has been amended. I've said this is the actions of an outlaw nation. And the drive behind this is concluding this um, concept that, you know, they were just powerless and they were just a minority back in those days, so even more so today. Um, and it says, it's, it's talking about, uh, <laughs> you know, um, as again, 1812, it says, west of Upper Canada, because this was Upper Canada area uh, that we were talking about. West of Upper Canada, however, uh, where the great sweep of plains and mountains and tundra stretch to the Pacific and Arctic Oceans, the Indian peoples still carried on their lives in apparent independence. For the most part, they were unaware that King George III claimed sovereignty over them. They were lords of the land for the present and were sustained by its abundant wildlife, though the fur traders, first agents of white incursion, had already begun their economic enslavement by making them dependent on trade goods and especially on firearms and ammunition. It's an interesting time to consider how uh, dependence on Canadian uh, institutions and functions has progressed. You know, it started in those fur trade days to say, let's alter their lifestyle, um, get them dependent and wanting what we can offer them. Um, and so, again, this is nothing new that's happening. It's a continuation, um, but it's a, if you will, tying the bow on the package time for wrapping it all up and concluding it so that legally um, these things can be said to actually exist. Uh, this book, by the way, is uh, published in 1989. Now, it's talking about, you know, this, the, you know, in terms of Canada, the emergent national myth mythography. You know, what's the Canadian myth? You know, how it came to be, what it is, is it a nation, etc. Uh, and as I've described many times, uh, it's an outlaw nation because it has created many myths as to th that are that are quite frankly false uh, regarding actual legal underlying title um, the existence of indigenous nations not being a domestic ethnic minority um, and and uh, so on so you know this is describing what you know what is this emergent this is back in you know 18 um, 1860s right and it's just emerging then. What, how can we describe, you know, how, what are we? What, what is Canada? Uh, it was really necessary to create this myth as to its origins. And back in that time, there was, you know, a couple of uh, people seen as rebels. Um, you know, one being William Lyon Mackenzie King and the other being uh, uh, Louis Joseph Papineau. And I won't get into why, um, but you know the positions they were taking in terms of how to proceed into developing into 
a nation were at odds with um, others of the time. But it says, um, you know, by the end of the 19th century, they were incorporated into the emergent national mythography. And it says that seen in hindsight, the reconciliation between the rebels and their society and their adoption into the mythology of Canada seems a necessary episode in our history. Truly revolutionary societies have no place for reconciliation because they have no place for dissent. So considering that this effort to, of reconciliation, um, that's an important point, you know. Reconciliation, no dissent, no voice. Um, these are all no consent. Um, these are all aspects that I have been pointing out over the, you know, 100 plus episodes that I've been doing here. But it says a non-revolutionary society like that of Canada did not impose a distinction between the faithful and the infidel. Our instinct for compromise appeared early. The pressures that rebellion had revealed were quickly relieved by reformist measures. The reconciliation of the rebels and their neutralization by absorption into the national myth was the final stage in arrangement, uh, apart from being morally laudable, was imperative in a society as young and fragile as that of the Canadas in the 1830s. Remember, there was Upper and Lower Canada at that time. They were provinces, not, not combined yet. So, you know, this again, what is being attempted with Indigenous nationals um, is something that was done before. Uh, and it's important to understand how, well, the distinctions and why, quite frankly, it really shouldn't be entertained um, and, and proceeded with on that basis. Why? You're not a domestic ethnic minority. Um, two, you have a voice, the voice, owners dictate, not uh, tenants, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, this concept of having only one authority um, asserted, um, not conquer, there's no conquering here, there's no conquest. This is not a situation such as the dealings between Britain, British and the French. Um, that then required those two people present to somehow forge a relationship um, despite one being a clear conqueror and the other being conquered. Um, none of these scenarios where these actions are suggested as being very helpful in forming Canada, the fact patterns are completely different and therefore any, from my perspective, my opinion, any hope of success in using those same tactics and strategies um, is, is, I suggest, is, is folly, pure folly to expect a, a decent outcome. Because you do, you know, you, you can't apply um, a solution to a different kind of problem that, you know, you, that you've applied to somewhere else. Um, it's time for um, correct thinking and that's the purpose of many of my episodes to say look I'm breaking through these myths this is a mythology this is what uh, Canada wants to say uh, happened it's not the reality it's not the legal reality of what happened it's not the legal reality of what's actually in effect today um, that you know that foundation that we should be building upon instead of trying to you know resort to these you know practical politics and and in ways of reconciling and trying to work things the way it's been done in the past. If those things were beneficial for Indigenous nationals, they would have happened at that time. They didn't. Um, you know, it's very clear today, and for instance, a lot of the negotiations and this reconciling, that led to um, constitutional documents being created. Our current Prime Minister Trudeau has been very clear. He's not opening up the Constitution. So all these different deals that are being done is not, and you remember um, uh, uh, Raybould, uh, Wilson Raybould um, had said, well, we need to complete Confederation. This is not completing Confederation because again, Trudeau is not opening up the Constitution. There is no, um, no 
discussion going on whatsoever akin to what was happening between French and English in this part of the world that led to constitutional documents and the um, conceding of self-government by uh, the Crown to, to Canada. Uh, it's a, it's a, a completely uh, different scenario that's being offered. A municipal government, it was clearly decided not to put municipal governments within confederation within the constitutional documents. They are not constitutional creatures. They are under the strict control of the province or in the case of indigenous um, new entities incorporated under federal legislation, they're, they're governed by those different arms. So in other words, there is no room being made whatsoever. There is no find our place within a confederation. This is not an exercise like has gone through the history of Canada when you review it. It's totally different, uh, with totally different outcomes. And it's really serious because, you know, the treaties are in place and that foundation does exist. So, um, you know, in, in recounting the nature of, it's important to understand the nature of Canadian politics, you know. Um, you know, it says uh, among, you know, Look at what Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier recognized, sadly, in a letter written near the end of his career. Remember this, that in politics the question seldom arises to do the ideal right. The best that can generally be done is to attain a certain object. And for the accomplishment of this object, many things have to be done which are questionable. And many things have to be submitted to which, if vigorously investigated, could not be approved of. This is the core of why I'm describing Canada as an outlaw nation. The kinds of things that are being done, and I won't get into a litany of those, review some of my episodes, um, they're designed to obtain a certain object. What's that object? Termination of Indigenous nations so that the treaties fall so that Canada control it all as the crown then picks up what's been left behind, what's been abandoned by the indigenous nationals, who now uh, become merely another Canadian minority. Um, and, uh, you know, the trickery, the uh, deception taking place, even with Section 35, for example, um, all very carefully planned and ready to roll once the, you know, the Constitution Act 1982 was, was um, uh, assented to. So, uh, continuing on, there's uh, a comment in, you know, 1830s through the mouth of Sam Slick, uh, so social critic at the time. Politics makes a man as crooked as a pack does a peddler. Not that they are so awful heavy either, but it teaches a man to stoop in the long run. And I put it to you that indigenous nationals have been taught to stoop. They have been, you know, shown how to do politics in, for the most part in the Liberal Party way. That example that goes back to what Sir, Sir Wilfrid Laurier describes. And, you know, and he, I always thought of him as, you know, as a pretty good guy, but he's admitting that, um, you know, this, this is the nature of the beast, right? Um, so politics, these practical politics, right? And says, it, practical politics in Canada, certainly. Why do I raise practical politics all the time? Because that's the big sales tool. Well, it's not practical for indigenous nations to exercise their jurisdictions and, and continue on in their sovereign position. It's just not practical. Um, the practical thing is sign off on these self-government agreements, you know, that abandons it all and come under and it's, you know, we'll take care of, you know, for, at least for the next uh, 10 years. Um, after that, well, you're pretty much on your own because, you know, uh, especially with the kind of crisis we're in now with quarantine, with loss of business, the economy, think about what's going to be left for a domestic ethnic minority in 10 years time. There's some talk it could take six years before this economy gets on a level foot again. Who knows, right? I suggest, I submit to you that as Indigenous nationals, now is not the time to be experimenting with abandoning what you have. Uh, to the contrary, 
those are important levers of that you need to to have uh, I respectfully submit to you um, you know your economic sovereignty your ability to provide for yourselves without interference um, you know to to gain you know um, start up and and um, you know re asphalt those trade routes you know and, and deal with each other and start providing um, instead of looking for Canada to be there because Canada has made you dependent and in doing so with the objective of making you docile and priming you to feel hopeless and feeling there's no other way. So it says, um, you know, practical politics in Canada certainly was a matter of sordid calculation and that those who were searching for higher things in it did so at their peril. I can attest to that. I did the right things. Um, I fulfilled my obligations as a Crown lawyer, for example. I fulfilled my obligations as a lawyer in private practice. Uh, and because I was pointing out the realities of Indigenous nations and their governance and how the, uh, the um, BC Treaty process was not actually about treaties but domestic land claims, how the self-government policies was not about recognizing existing jurisdiction but rather um, a, you know, demonstrating an abandonment of your actual jurisdiction and accepting what the governments of the time of Canada will choose to give to you. Because remember, those agreements are not treaties. They're clear to say that. Um, they're all done under Section 35, and as I've emphasized so often, the Section 35 doctrine allows for complete infringement when there's a meaningful economic objective underway. I put it to you that given the state that we're in, whether it's accidental or manufactured, that, uh, you know, it will be so easy to close down anything that tries to hang on to being a Section 35 quote-unquote right, because they're not rights. They are lawful ways of precluding you um, from, from exercising your jurisdictions. When you say you come under that, whether you do it in all these agreements being signed, whether you do it under the legislation where it's being put in there, whether you're doing it through land claims, um, you know, you are giving up who you are, what you have, and that means you're wholly at the mercy, literally, of what Canada has left over and whether Canada wishes to provide for you. Now, given the systemic racism, I pointed out those kinds of matters, um, wow, you know, is that a place to put all your eggs, you know? Um, it's not certainly a comfortable position to be leaving uh, to your next generations. You know, and it's talking about, you know, these, these concepts that were being discussed at the time in the, in the mid-1800s, 1850s and so. You know, here is one, there's an idea, you know, um, this is attributed to John Beverly Robinson, seems to have invented the concept of a kingdom of Canada. Well, when I look at the actions of our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, um, and, you know, kind of as his then right, you know, temporarily right-hand man being the national chief of the AFN, for example, the Assembly of First Nations. You know, it is this idea of, of control. Remember, constitutional monarchy means the Crown must act on the advice of her Privy Council members, which are primarily, um, you know, Prime Minister, and the ministers of the time, but everyone who's been elected to office that's still alive remains, even after you're no longer in office, you remain a Privy Council member. Um, all governor generals uh, as well. Um, so these ideas, you know, that, you know, we need to be the sole sovereign, we need to get rid of this yoke of the treaties, um, and we need to assimilate and get these Indians to be like every other provincial citizen. Um, you know, with the exception that, you know, here's the mythos of how that came to be. This is what they wanted. They said they were never nations. They said they, you know, they really needed our help. They wanted to come under us and be taken care of by us. 
you know, it couldn't be further from the truth, but that's the myth. That's what Canada has created. And, um, you know, you, you look at, um, again, the end of the uh, 1800s, uh, and, and consider the depth and age and length of time that Indigenous nations have been sovereign. Right here was the, the discussion. Um, this was by um, uh, politician Amor de Cosmos, so this was on the, the West Coast. He says, I see no reason why the people of Canada should not look forward to Canada becoming a sovereign and independent state. So... Clearly, now remember, the treaties were entered into before that statement was made. Those treaties are not with Canada. Canada could not enter into treaties because Canada was not a sovereign state. Canada, uh, Her Majesty, is able to exercise partial political sovereignty. She has delegated self-government to Canadian governments, but it does not um, take away the fact that this is still a nation being born. Um, being formed and unfortunately it is still being done by that approach um, that is less than honest that is as I've said when it comes to um, indigenous nations it is an outlaw approach because it undermines the um, constitutional requirements for how the crown and her governments are to act vis-a-vis uh, -vis indigenous nations you know and if you go back to, this is a, a chief uh, presentation in 1887 uh, into a, uh, addressing a commission into uh, grievances. It says, what we don't like about the government is they're saying this, quote, we will give you this much land. How can they give it when it is our own? We cannot understand it. They have never bought it from us or our forefathers. They have never fought and conquered our people and taken our land that way. And yet they say now that they will give us so much land, our own land. Um, now, unfortunately, this is in the area where, you know, Nishka land claim, final land claim settlement was done. So they actually settled, uh, you know, despite having this on their record uh, as to how, how can you do this? Well, they said, well, Okay, we're going, we're going to go along, give us some of your land. Um, so the fact is that those nations that have treaties, um, you know, Canada cannot abolish those treaties. Uh, Canada doesn't have that power. The treaty-making power remains with the Queen, with the Crown. Uh, but Canada can evidence that the treaties have been abandoned and fall and are null and void because the indigenous nations no longer exist. In fact, indigenous nationals and their lawyers representing that those nations never did exist in the first place. That gets us back to doctrine of discovery. They weren't developed enough as human beings to ever have concepts of societies and governance. So, um, you know, there was a comment made, you know, um, regarding these treaties that were made uh, treaties, you know, number 1 to 11, made between 1871 and 1921. Um, and this is a view that was expressed in 1891. It says, um, um, what is the secret of our wonderful success in dealing with the Indian? It can be told in very few words. We acknowledge their title and right to the land, and a treaty once made with them, we keep it. It's a simple concept, isn't it? But that is the core of what is supposed to be happening. And instead, Canada is spending billions of dollars, you know, in all these initiatives, hiring however many people, um, you know, and in putting Indigenous nationals in positions to negotiate like a navigator, um, you know, navigator into the new land that's not your land. Um, you know, this, if it was simply... Um, focused on these few short sentences, you know, acknowledge their title and right to the land that's been done already by treaty. And a treaty once made with them, we keep it. And where there are no treaties, the obligation under the duty of fairness of the crown, treaties must be entered into. But no, that is not what uh, is happening in Canada today.
So you have Canada acknowledging in its own need to make things up <laughs> in order to say, hey, uh, uh, we're, we're a country, uh, we're a nation, sort of, we're, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, doing things to meet an object. And there's other quotes here that point out aspects of activities that were unconstitutional. Um, that's another way of saying outlaw, because you're not following the rule of law, you're not following the Constitution. So it's, you know, you think about all that, and I want to just close this session with this, is that uh, in 1814, the French-speaking and English-speaking inhabitants of the Canadas were numerically roughly equal. And it is likely, though we have no clear date, that the number of native peoples in the whole of British North America before the great epidemics of smallpox, measles, and influenza was more or less equal to that of white people. By 1901, the proportions had shifted so much that the 100,000 or so surviving natives represented about 2% of a population of about 5.5 million. Uh, and despite a phenomenal birth rate and an enormous increase in numbers, French speakers had fallen to about 30% of the population. At the same time, the settlement of the prairies brought in hundreds of thousands of people who were neither French nor British in origin or language. In 1901, they formed 12% of the population, and by the Great War, uh, World War I, um, they had reached 15%. If you look at the population situation today, and I've done a you know sort of a rough calculation, it's clear that the in population of Indigenous nationals is increasing, has increased significantly. Um, so you're you're not at those smallest numbers you've been. You're not at that, you know, recovering from the epidemics, um, where you were most vulnerable you're actually growing in numbers. Do you need to have recourse to Canadian politicians feeding you how to do things? Um, Canada has moved forward with uh, consolidating and enlarging areas, you know, uh, that's what Confederation uh, Constitution Act 1867 was all about, right? Bringing the colonies, the state, the provinces together to form one Canada. And continues that effort by trying to obtain your abandonment of your lands. Why would you do the opposite? Why would you uh, break yourselves down from, a, from the whole of the country, the whole of the nations, why would you allow yourselves to be broken down into small little remnants? It's the opposite of what you need to be doing, uh, especially as your numbers grow. It gives you a stronger foundation, more access to people who can perform the functions that are needed, even if temporarily um, the example of those expert in, in fields is necessary still. Because the Canadian grown models are premised on the fact that you don't deserve to have what you have. That it's better to be in the hands of Canadian governments controlling through the constitutional monarchy situation. Really think about that. It's not a strategy that Canada is applying to itself. It's a strategy being used against you as Indigenous nationals to terminate who you are and what you have so that Canada can actually give some credence to its myth of how it came to be and how it is. It's in your hands, not in the hands of, of Canadian governments. It's in your hands as Indigenous nationals. You simply need to say and remind who you are, what you have, and that you're not abandoning it, no matter who signs what to whom. And that's all I have to say.